Hey gang, do you find yourself listening to your music on one app and then listening to your podcast on another app? If you do, stop this insane behavior right now and download Spotify. Spotify is home to all of your favorite music and all of your favorite podcasts. Podcasts including Fly on the Wall, the Saturday Night Live podcast with Dana Carvey and David Spade, the Rock on Tours podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt, old favorites like Fresh Air, My Favorite Murder, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Look, if you're looking for a news podcast or sports or entertainment or true crime look if you're if you're looking for a sewing podcast or an rv podcast spotify has all of this for you that's spotify all of your favorite music and all of your favorite podcasts in one place find it in your app store and start listening today that's spotify music and podcasts let's get down Johnny, I'm your host. Welcome to the show. I hope you guys all had a good weekend, whatever it is you did this weekend. Halloween weekend. Did you get out there? Did you dress up? Did you go live out some fantasy out in public dressed as someone else? (laughs) People love to do that, man. I'll tell you. Uh, Skyrocket played on Friday at the Rail House Bar in in Kyle, Texas. It was a good show. It was a fun show. It was cold. It was windy. A lot of people came in from out of town. That was cool to see, but people didn't dress up. We didn't dress up. Oh, wait. Wait. We didn't dress up and neither did the audience except for four people in the audience were dressed up and that that wasn't very happening. I felt bad for them. I'm actually doing this intro on Halloween day and I'm playing tonight at Saxon Pub with Dr. Plankenstein. So by the time this comes out, that would have already happened. I'm sorry you missed it. Uh, But I'm doing this intro on Halloween day and this morning I went out and ran some errands and one of those errands was to do my early voting. And I cannot tell you guys how easy it was. I walked into the place, I voted, I, there was no one in there, I mean, the, the election people were there, but no one else was voting, walked in, did my voting, walked out, another guy was walking in, hey buddy, hey buddy, I was on my way out, that's it, lickety split baby, no fuss, no muss, you're in, you're out, early voting is a great way to have your voice heard, I know, I know a lot of people like to wait till election day, but that's a pain in the fucking ass, and if a bunch of shit comes up that day, you get tied up doing other stuff, you're not going to make it out to vote. I'm telling you, you won't. And this isn't like a presidential election, so people don't think it's that, oh, you know, well, you know, um, you know, well, you know. However, people like procrastinate and, and like put that shit off. This is an important, this is an important election to everyone, apparently. So uh, get out there and have your voice heard. And hopefully uh, we can turn the tide or, you know, whatever, keep the steer the ship into a direction that we want to live in. Gang, I have a great show for you guys today. Yes, I have a great, great, great show for you today. I talked to Art Rock Band, San Antonio Art Rock Band, Buttercup. But this episode, I go off campus. This is a field trip episode. I went down to LaGrange to the fabulous listening room, The Bugle Boy. Fantastic, fantastic place, man. I went down there and talked to them before their show. They played like a, a, a week and a half ago on a Sunday afternoon. They did a special afternoon show there at the Bugle Boy. And I went down there. Uh, my friend Richard Scantz books this place. And we, we had set up something back in June to do something with another band. But they had caught COVID and we didn't get to do it. So then he told me Buttercup was coming. And I was so excited because I love the band Buttercup. And uh, I'm old friends with Odie and Eric Sandin. They were in a band in the 90s called uh, Evergreen. And uh, we played some shows together, but became really good, tight friends and, and very close buddies in a, in, in, with very little time. That happens sometimes in music. Like you just hit it off. Like bands become like brother bands. And that's what happened. I ended up meeting Joe Reyes from the band uh, earlier, uh, like 10 years ago or something. I was, I was doing a songwriter thing at, uh, at Strange Brew, and he came out and played with Salim Nerala. Then I had him on the podcast. Anyway, I've wanted to have Buttercup on for a long time, and uh, and this was my chance. My friend Richard Scantz reached out to me. He said, Buttercup's coming on. Do you want to do this thing out at the Bugle Boy? And I was like, hell yeah, man. I've been hearing about the Bugle Boy for years. My circle of friends, people go out there and 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 
go see shows. A ton of my friends go out there and play, and I'm like, what's going on out there? And it's just a magical listening room. Going out there for myself was really great. They have a fantastic staff, this lady Heather, and of course Richard, and all the people there were so nice. I forgot my, my, uh, I forgot my memory card to do the interview, so I couldn't record it when I got there. They ran out, got it for me, just so nice, just such nice people. Everyone was accommodating. The place is really nice. It's like in a in a in an old army barrack. I can read to you from their brochure, because it's a nonprofit, and they do all kinds of stuff. Like, they do all kinds of, like, community outreach. They do youth concerts. They do nursing home contest concerts. Sorry. They do nursing home concerts. They uh, they partner with Swan Songs, who you've heard here on the show even just last month, my friend Christine Albert's uh, nonprofit, and uh, Soldier Songs and Voices, who you've heard with, uh, with Dustin and Kevin Welch. And it's just an amazing listening room. So let me read to you from their, uh, from their brochure. After retrofitting a World War II Army barracks, the Bugle Boy Listening Room opened in, in January 2005 with the mission to elevate and sustain original live music. Today, the venue is hailed as one of the country's premier listening rooms. From the friendly staff, I can vouch for that, and volunteers, comfortable theater seating, and excellent acoustics, I can vouch for that as well. It's a fantastic place. Concert goers are sure to enjoy a wonderful evening of music. Now, you can get out there and find out more about the Bugle Boy and support them by going to thebugleboy.org. But I do urge you, man, if you live in Austin or maybe you're listening, you live in Bastrop or Smithville or something, get out there to the Bugle Boy and see a show, man. There's so many great people have played there. They have, uh, I think they do it seasonally, their concerts. I don't know exactly how that works, but you can go to bugleboy.org uh, and find out more about Bugle Boy uh, Foundation. But they've had Ray Wiley Hubbard, uh, Carolyn Wonderland, Ruthie Foster, Carrie Rodriguez, uh, Marsha Ball, Shake Russell, Shelley King, South Austin Moonlighters, Jamie Lynn Wilson, and so many more intimate concerts in a great listening room and it's not like a get wasted place like it's not like they have a shop bar or some shit there like jägermeister stuff that you can you can get off the bar and start start drinking it's like yeah they got beer and wine but they also have coffee cokes water and stuff like you go there you go you're going there to listen to the music you're not going there to party and get wasted it's a definitely like a listening room the bugle boy go check it out bugle boy the bugle boy dot org you can uh i'll put a link to it in the text of this podcast now let me just tell you it was great. Uh, it was great going out there, and it was great meeting all the fine folks there. As I said, Heather and talking to Richard and all those gang out there. But it was so great catching up with Eric and Odie and Joe from the band Buttercup. Buttercup is a is an art rock band from San Antonio. If you don't know about this band, a lot of people in Texas do. A lot of hip people know about Buttercup because Buttercup started off like not playing. Uh, they started off in in I think in two thousand and three. They started out putting music in like 2004 because I, what I remember is like when Buttercup started, I was like, oh, I was following them on like MySpace. And so throughout the time of, uh, of social media, I've been able to follow them and their rise and everything they've done. They just did a tour. They just put out a record called Specs, which is uh, an autobiotic, autobiographical record, uh, which has songs about each member. And uh, it was great catching up with these guys. As I said, I know these guys from well, Odie and Eric from when they were in Evergreen. We tell a great story about when we were all playing a cable convention for this, uh, this cable channel called Much Music in the 90s in Dallas where we opened for, uh, for Robbie Krieger. All of us. Anyway, it was a great time. We talk about it. Eric and I catch up about about what we thought about Robbie, Robbie Krieger's outfit that day. Because even though it happened in like 1996, we still remember what the dude was wearing. Anyway, Buttercup has gone on to put out a ton of, of records. Fantastic records. Uh, all just very different from each other. Exploring all kinds of different things. And this new record, uh, Specs, an autobiographical record, they, there's a song about each of the members, and they're they're fantastic, fantastic songs. Uh, their last record, Battle of Flowers, is also very, very great. You can find them at wearebuttercup.com. They have a fantastic uh, uh, band camp site. So go there and buy their music there. If you buy music, get out there. If you want to support this band, support them that way. It was great catching up with these guys. It was great sitting down at the Bugle Boy and having this great conversation in such a beautiful environment. I urge all of you to get out there and check out the Bugle Boy. In LaGrange, get out there, take someone on a date. That's what I thought when I, I was like, ooh, maybe I'll take someone on a date to the Bugle Boy in LaGrange. That sounds pretty cool. 
Go to thebugleboy.org. You can follow Buttercup at wearebuttercup.com. We have such a great conversation. I want to thank everybody at Bugle Boy. I want to thank all the dudes from Buttercup, uh, Eric Sandin, Joe Reyes, Odie. So great seeing those guys again. So great catching up. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation from the Bugle Boy in LaGrange. This is me and Buttercup chatting it up. Let's get down. We're at the Bugle Boy in LaGrange. I need to acknowledge that from the get-go. Normally, I'm in my apartment, but we, we came to the Bugle Boy at the, uh, our friend Richard Scantz suggested that, that we do this thing here, and this is really awesome being here. So I'd like to validate that, too. Yeah, it's yeah. a great room. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything about We're it. We're here. Yeah, I've already, I've already started my brain. The mice are working double time on that wheel go round thing, because uh, this is our practice gig i already have ideas for the next one we're coming back oh yeah we haven't even done this so one yet. you're okay so there's so much to get through this first of all i'm going to say this that we uh we know each other from over 25 years ago mm-hmm. yeah. from when you guys had a band called evergreen but you were not in evergreen no no, no. i was like Joe. alongside them like but in the jazz world and okay we were all, and yeah, we were forget. all kind of going around yeah okay it's the same places though the same cities and whatnot yeah so that that band with Jamie and Charlie, and was there another guy? Kevin Higginbotham. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I remember a great party in Dallas in a hotel room, if you guys remember that. Mm-hmm. Where we played these much music mm-hmm. yes. oh, wow. things. Do you remember that? Those. Right. Yeah. We, played, yeah, we yeah. played with Robbie Krieger. With Robbie Krieger. Yeah. Right. yeah. It, was like, it was like oh, our bands and Robbie Krieger. Right. right. Yeah. And I remember Robbie had... He sounded just like Jim Morrison saying. <laughs> he sounded great. And he looked like he had completely given up. <laughs> he did. He, he, was, he had those, yeah, like, those, those pants with uh, elastic yeah. and the Sammy Hagar yeah. pants. And, and he had like his wallet <laughs> and, and so his clearly. keys in, in the front pocket. And yeah. it looked Wait, like he had right maybe now, some kind of hip cancer, like yeah. a big goiter sticking out. <laughs> and it looked, he looked horrible, like, like <laughs> kind of like Gallagher or something. You know, just, just yeah, very, yeah, 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 very, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I thought at the time, I will never... <laughs> Ever, I, I wear pants like that. I will. I will not give up. And I have pants like that now that I wear. I and, wear and and Crocs. You I know what's Crocs. fucked I, up I, I is like I wonder Crocs if he's like if he was like the age we are now. Yeah, then absolutely. Yeah, oh, right. so. be, right. yeah. Like he was like right. little, 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 little. Yeah, yeah no yeah. kidding. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm thinking like, man, I just it's, yeah, these are good enough, and then puts on the parachute yeah. pants and goes plays the gig. Well, I'm glad we're all still wearing regular clothes. Yeah. No one's given up here, as far as you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crumbs all over me. Like no one's given up here. Yeah. Um, this is radio, not video. Oh, yeah. Thank God. The other thing I remember, just the last blast from the past, and we'll get on to the Buttercup world, was uh, you guys doing, like you guys, you guys did Exile on Main Street a few times. Do you remember that? Uh, more oh, than yeah. a few more times. Than a few yeah. times. Yeah. But I remember going in Austin and singing some song with Did you we guys. do it in Austin? Uh-huh. I remember oh, yeah. like Where? White Rabbit or something like, not yeah. White, Rabbit. White Rabbit. Really? Uh, White Rabbit, yeah, because mm-hmm. there was no one kidding. in Austin, yeah. I'll be darned. Whoa. I don't remember that. God, I remember the venue and everything. Yeah, wow. no, I remember it. And, and I remember that we, this is before um, YouTube videos, and so to figure out those songs, we figured them out by oh ear. Oh my God, that oh was God. so and difficult. Were, and we did it in standard tuning. And now I know. Right. That that's uh, yeah. not in. It's super simple, but we were doing ridiculous um, <laughs> calisthenics with our hands. I was stretching like eight frets to do things. And yeah. It was so dumb. Where you could just, if you tune right. it open, you it's can just standard. mash your finger down and it sounds fine. Well, yeah. also, also after you, because we didn't have. <laughs> he's not working that hard. <laughs> no, he's not. He's no, smart. He's not. He knows yeah. how to work. We didn't have stage tuners back then either. So you put the record on, and depending on if your record's running at the actual 33 oh RPM right or exactly like yeah. you tuned your yeah. guitar to that but right. by the time you get to the second after rocks off which is the yeah. opener yeah and then the next song you're already off like a, a quarter yeah. cent or something and oh, by yeah. the third song that. like right. you're what you have to retune the yeah. entire instrument mm, that was yeah. back in the day when that. they would just go to a piano in the studio and tune to a note but right. who knows what that piano who knows here. what that exactly was tuned right to. Yeah. and then who knows where the <laughs> tape got pitched around right they were like oh, a little faster zing you know a few 
more, you know, just feet per second on the tape will make it rise and pitch. So I'd love that back in the 60s, it was like that. Like guitars weren't completely in tune with each other. No. Drums weren't really captured in this way that you heard every well, part you of the were, drum You were kit. just saying in the car on the way up here, talking about ACDC. Yeah. When they recorded, like their, their guitars were not even in tune with themselves. And then they would tune, the, the two guitars separated Are were not even tuned. not even in tune. Yeah. But and that then they spread sounds great. It sounds like a band. It, sounds, it still sounds like classic recording to me. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it was the little, you know, stomp box tuner that kind of killed rock and roll because it's like everybody's in tune now. It's, not, it's, it's kind of sad. I think you are, you are attracted to this because you physically cannot be out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah. this area well. This right. is true. Yeah. To be out We've of tune. Hey, Joe relies on there. Eric and myself for our instruments to be out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> because he's in tune. He cannot not be in tune. Yeah, or out of, he can't be out of time. I, that's our, our realm. Oh, yeah. 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 He's, a, he's this good straight realm, bullet it's the, line. It's the realm that I really appreciate, though. This realm of like self-taught, uh, self-learning, self-growing people that, that love music for music's sake and don't get bogged down into the minutiae of it, like I did, like as a kid. But there's always like a scientist, I always feel like, in a, in especially yes. like in a rock and roll band. You need a guy that knows Yeah, Tommy, that knows Tommy stuff. Ramone worked yeah, in exactly. studios. Like he had actually yeah. done like hit recordings before you know the Ramones step into that studio together. Yeah. So there's one guy. Yeah, well, the, you're right. The, it's probably one guy in The band. tuning police, the, the yeah. time police, mm-hmm. the... Mm-hmm. You know, that's Joe that. Reyes. Yeah, Joe Reyes. Yeah, but I, but this band doesn't you're need policing. Like, do you guys? Do you? Okay, so let me ask you this. Okay, so your new record, uh, Specs. There's a, is that real strings on us be them, or yes, it is. Yeah, Jody's bowing a um, bowing upright. a bass, an upright bass. Yeah. Okay. Right. And then there is like a string pad somewhere in there, it, maybe in the back. But that's under, not strings, under, right? No, that's like a synth, like an old Roland string machine or something. But yeah, Odie's, it sounds pretty Odie's real. Bowing, Odie's yeah. bowing it. Yeah, okay. right. Maybe yeah, that's what's coming it. Yeah, through the meat of it. Is. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, there's a few passages. And you can hear uh, I'm very pitchy. I'm not an upright player, so and so that it makes it sound, sound even more real. Again. Right. Yeah. It yeah. satisfies was... Joe's need for something to be out of. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's just something about. I'm the too words good. All Odie, get on the bass. <laughs> so in going through your stuff, like when did you put out? You guys have been together almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. And you put out your first record when? It has been 20 years. Like right? 2007, yeah. 2006, 2005? What? 2004? I think 2004, 2004 was okay. our first record. Yeah. Right. Secula Fire. We did a DVD, a DVD documentary before that. Before that. Yeah. That's, That's what I was trying to see if you had a, some yeah. kind of weird link to that. We do. I thought, I, I thought we put it on our YouTube. I think it is. Oh. It's on YouTube. Actually, it is on YouTube. Oh, great. Yeah. I'll I thought you were going to say, I thought we had some more. They don't call me Johnny Research for nothing. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Johnny (laughs) Research. Um, All right. So uh, this record is, from what I can tell from your discography, different in that there's like a real focus to it. It's a concept record. Right. As it is basically describing each of you guys. Right. And Claire, who's not here. Right. And is Claire here sometimes? Is there? She, she moved to L.A. Okay, and so um, Claire is is a rocket ship taking off right now. Oh, Planet Claire! Yeah. She's on her own she's place. On, she's yeah. on her own place. Yeah, but we're happy for her. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's we were amazing. glad that we were. We're happy for it. her and very sad for us. Yeah. yeah, I went and listened. Like I went and and listened to her stuff, like just to see like where she coming from. And I saw that she was based in L.A., but I didn't know if she lived there and then moved here, yeah. or moved, lived here and then moved. Anyway, her stuff is out there. Yeah, like really. Oh yeah. Um, and, and in an awesome way. Um, okay, so uh, so in making this record specs and in writing it, was it? Did you set out to make a record like this to do this autobiographical? You know, it, it's something that that we've been toying with for years. Um, this idea of of writing what you know, and then also being honest and being really honest. And so there's there's been a couple of songs. I mean, I made a joke many years ago, like, why doesn't Morrissey just write a song called Morrissey? Because, I mean, it seems like they're all about him. They're all, <laughs> you know, like his big ego. And like, just just do it. And then, and so I, I we wrote a song called Eric Sandin, and it was kind of a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, um, and it's kind of this heavy metal song. Like, on a, on a, it's gonna, yeah, we did this years ago. And then there was, so during the pandemic, I was doing a lot of creative nonfiction writing okay. and then feeling guilty about not writing songs okay. in this time where I have all this time. But then 
um, the New York Times article came out yesterday saying that, like, did you get less creative during the pandemic? Your personality changed. Um, yeah. th th like, that's an actual thing that happened. Um, oh. And for me, I, I felt wildly kind of uncreative, at, at least yeah. with music. Yeah, and, me too. And, and felt sad. Um, but uh, so I felt guilty, you know, I'm going to write something. But I was doing this creative nonfiction and then... Uh, and that was like memoir kind of writing. Okay. Hit memories, a lot of stuff about music um, growing up in the 80s. And um, then I, I don't know, I just was like, oh, I've been one, I had v several iterations of a song called Joe Reyes that never could be written. But it, you know, it was like this really kind of like uh, heartfelt song about friendship. Yeah. You know, we write a lot, a lot of songs about love. Yeah. But I thought this would be nice to have. Joe Friendship. deserves a love song. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and and he, yeah. and and so we got it. We we did it. But when I came with the the ideas of the songs, I, I had an old typewriter. I was just typing up the lyric, and for several of them, like like I love my voice, which is about my voice and my um, yeah. complicated relationship and shame about my voice. Yeah. Um, Do you send this song to Nico Case? By the way, I need to. I, I, t I tagged her in a tweet, but I don't you think did? she she got that yet. So Joe okay. needs to get on that. Uh, yeah, that's right. He, she sent him a heart once. Oh, that's really? True. Yeah, we were listening to her in the van, and I think I said something like, "She's the man," and, yeah. then, and then she liked that. I mean, that's Claire's good. close to her. Claire could should yeah. should do that. Okay, um, sorry. Go ahead. But yeah, it, it, so I brought that lyric to the to the rehearsal, and we were all there. And Joe's like, "Oh, cool! You wrote the song." And I'm like, "He's like, how's it going?" I'm like, "I don't know. I don't have any." He's like, "Well, what's the melody?" I'm like, "There is nothing. It's just this idea." Yeah. Well, how do the lyrics go? Like this, maybe? Mm -hmm. And then we created in the course of, like, you know, it took a little while, but not too long. We just nah. kind of created a, a piece yeah, together. Really quick. Yeah, and then Odie, like, you know, came up with the, like, melody at the end that actually has a little melody. Um, yeah. The, it was all kind the, of fun. Like, all, both of you guys are shrugging. Right, all I don't know. all I don't the collaborations that. are like that, I want to say. But this one definitely comes out of the pandemic and this time when we've got way too much time to, to look at ourselves and, and be introspective. And so I think the fact that it actually yielded some good art is amazing to me. I think definitely that's the hallmark of our band. Yeah. Because we can take something, some adversity or something. Yeah. But flip it into something that's beautiful to look at or listen to again. And so... I think that's it. I think that's the idea is to morph those things into something that we can all cherish again. So, cause it was hard. It was really hard for all of us to just not be performing, working, just, mm -hmm. we couldn't be in the same room together. I think we all experienced that and it was awful I for mean, people who generally like are together. Yeah. Well, Johnny, you were the person I'm cutting. I'm so, I just read a book about masculinity and interruption and here I am. Go. But you as were like the you person took it all in. who, uh, who like you could play and sing at a time where Odie and I could not do either of those things, and we were like Johnny Gowdy. He knows how to play Beatles songs, and he can do it. What do you uh, mean? You guys we were amazing. You guys were amazing. We you looked, were like so we next tier to compared you. to our yeah. band. Really? Maynard. Oh yeah, you guys were. Yeah, wow. you guys were harmonizing, and musicians. we were like. Oh, they're just trying, and, and we were like clubbing our instruments, like Eric yeah. on guitar, me on bass. Like we might as well had a, a baseball bat in our hands. Like it's true. What are we doing? It had a it had a minimalism. When are we gonna get drunk? Sweet, but um, and I remember that. But and you were such a good performer. Um, so for the pandemic, did it affect you not being able to perform? Uh, no, I still sang in my phone at people. Like, <laughs> good you know for what you. I mean? Like I did live streams. Oh right, That's cool. right. That's but good. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, my relationship with performing has changed a lot since then. My relationship to performing, like it's, 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 uh, I, I'm okay with, I love myself now. You know what I mean? Oh, right, <laughs> like, yeah. Like that's, I used to perform to like, like mm -hmm. nobody loved me. And right. I, like, like if my dad wasn't gonna acknowledge me, then everyone in the fucking world would. You know what I mean? Like I, sure. and I had that sort of like, Absolutely. I feel like now it's much more uh, professional. Like then it <laughs> right. was very raw and I was just like, if there's one person in the room, they're never gonna forget that they were here. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. I don't. I don't. Totally relate. Really. I'm. Sure. I'm not fighting for that level of attention anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Isn't that interesting? As you get older, you get a little bit more comfortable with yourself, and sure. you're like, or hopefully, which is which is why you don't care if you have 
Crocs or those big old <laughs> I still MC care. Hammer pants. I still care. I don't have Crocs yeah. and we're I don't wear shorts yet, to public we're, places. We're, we're I was going to say, I haven't reached Robbie Krieger level yet, <laughs> although I feel like a tipping point is it's close. It's so funny that you remember those pants because I remember them too. <laughs> I know. I saw it. Your eyes light up when yeah. I said the band. And you're I like the elastic. And I'm whenever like, exactly. I tell the Robbie Krieger story, I'm always like, and you guys, man, he was wearing like, <laughs> I think he was wearing a fanny pack. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He was just not. Yeah. <laughs> He was okay. not rocking. Wait a minute. Thank you for that for that lovely compliment. Because I, I remember oh. uh, there's a, a funny thing, and I was saying to Anar the other day when I was telling him that I was coming to go to talk to you guys, is that in all of my memories, like whatever they are, there's like maybe five times we hung out together. Mm-hmm. But they were awesome, and they were wow. epic, and I always smile when I think about all you guys. Sure. Yeah, me Honestly. too. Same yeah. thing. Me too. That's Good. fun. Yeah. Um, so, Joe, you were saying that like you had to take this time and this experience that you were having and turning it into art. And that's that's one thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about, because you are not like an art rock band and not like an art pop band, but like an art project band. Is that what you are? Do you see yourselves as that? Well, I, I think, do. I yeah. think that's the best. More than like Evergreen was like a rock and roll band. Right. Yeah. I think that's true. This isn't a rock and roll band. There's like a whole other right. thing. You guys, there's an intention going on before you go rock. I'd say it's all song oriented. I realize now that if you have the right template, it's like we could create anything around it and it would work. So I say it's the really strong songwriting of Eric combined with whatever Odie and I can bring to it that really kind of give the band any sort of like kind of direction or flow, but it's always good. Like there's never a dud. There's never this feeling like, ah, there's nothing we can do with this. And if we did like hit a wall, it would simply just go like kind of like back on the list, but maybe somewhere else. And we would return to it and go, oh, we were going it too fast. Or maybe it doesn't need drums or whatever. And then suddenly we pull something out. And that might be from years of me, you know, doing that sort of production work with the Morales brothers and Mm -hmm. working with a lot of people through the 80s and 90s to see how records were made. Yeah. And go, oh, wow, that's actually a good idea. Yeah. And perhaps subconsciously all those things are coming out as we're writing and, you know, arranging the songs. But it doesn't come from like an egotistic place. It's just like that would sound best. Right. And then we all have to agree. That's the other thing. We, We have to come to an agreement before it will work. So that's, in, in essence, I think it's the three of us, but someone has to spearhead it all, and I feel like it's Eric. So, so you come in with like an idea like you were talking about. Mm-hmm. You had that, the lyrics for that song. and Yeah, I, I mean, I would like to proffer that, I mean, he's a, a super strong songwriting. It is, that's collective because, I, I mean, I think the thing that I can bring sometimes is an idea that, that the song is about something. I don't know that that's absolutely necessary, but that's how we work. Mm-hmm. You know, like a, a, there's some kind of conceit behind mm-hmm. it that I think is interesting. Um, but it's the CPR that, that Odie and Joe, and Joe perform on the the very feeble and, and yeah. premature baby yeah. um, skeleton that, that I, I birth, begin to birth. Yeah. And then they blow on it and, and, yeah. and push down and, and perform the so essentially we're resuscitation. All- right. Yeah, but we're all parents. We're co-parenting. We're co-parenting these little right. songs. Doing a great job. Yeah, thanks. thanks. I love it. It's, Raising it's very favorite. rare that we need to bust out the defibrillator, but... It happens. If it's necessary, it's necessary. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, the, we, and, and it's all we all agree on it. Is yeah. that time? Yes. But as, as, as you know, when you were mentioning about the art part, I mean, I love that Joe says it's about the songs, and I think that that is our... our you know, if there's a manifesto, an sure. unspoken manifesto of the band, it's it's that we love these quality songs, um, and and you know the fascinating thing with songs is that they can take any form. You know that that that, that what should on paper be lousy sometimes is wonderful, mm-hmm. um, and and you know even Depeche Mode has a song with one note. You know, like the melody is one note. You know, like I mean yeah. the, these things that you just don't know are surprising and it works. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think there's 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 a playfulness with the way that we approach the song that spills into the performance. Yeah, I think they're the they're they're twinned. Yeah, there was a word and I can't remember what it is now that I was thinking on Friday when I was listening to this stuff like all together. There's a great uh, for people that listen to Spotify. I know that a lot of people get mad. You guys have a very good Bandcamp page where all your stuff is available on there. People should go there. But there's also Thank like a, a this is Buttercup playlist. On Spotify, oh yeah, I think I Spotify know. just makes them. Yeah, but uh, it's it's really good. Oh, right. cool. <laughs> yeah, it does everything from specs on back to the oh, first record. Great. Yeah, it's nice to listen to. Oh, that's nice on your drives. 
But yeah, I'm glad you guys have a band camp and you, you seem to keep that very active and that seems to be the focus of places to... Yeah, I like band camp. Yeah. That's my work, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, it's really Eric. Not Neither Odie or I are online like that. Um, so that, that's been a huge change throughout the thing. How, what is your relationship to, uh, to, to the streaming services and what they, does, does that matter to you? Um, we, I don't know if we ever sold enough records that it would that's, have mattered. That's the way right. I've always looked at yeah. it. Like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, now I'm like, well, at least everyone can find it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? I, I do feel like <laughs> access is, is probably the greatest asset that yeah. the thing has, which is like literally like in your phone, you can pull up a song that yeah you wrote or produced yeah. or whatever. But, but I, I feel bad for people whose, you know, livelihood was based on, on sales, right? right. Like right. any, like Nico Case is a good example of somebody like who could lose their farm simply because they just can't sell as many albums yeah. as they used to before. Yeah. And then, then when they tour, they have to make sure, you know, the venue's big enough for them to earn enough for the break even. Everything, all the expenses for touring have gone up. Um, just one cancellation can throw the whole thing into arrears and suddenly you're in debt again it's like it's really tough these days i don't know anybody really who doesn't supplement their income with some other uh art related job it's usually teaching like for eric and i and, and odie like we're all you know like teachers music uh, teachers or uh, eric, actually good. uh eric tutors awesome and i teach guitar yeah okay. and then eventually you know some of those students will like end up writing songs and i can help them record them yeah right so that feeds in kind of to the engineering producing side of what i do yeah but all of that stuff is so grassroots we're lucky that we live in a community where kind of you know everybody knows us and knows whom to reach out to in that right. in that moment it's right. like oh call him or i you know i definitely send people both ways like you know oh you need to talk to this guy he would be great right, right. or eric's talk or to this Eric. girl or this, yeah, anyone, anyone who's out there working, yeah. So uh, I think, again, it's it's a double-edged sword. I, I hate that there's some multi-billion cor- <laughs> corporation that's that's earning something off our backs. I just wish they would cut us in a little bit more is all. Right. Yeah. I've, I, yeah. I've never, I've never been, I've never lived off of the right. sales of my records. No. I lived off advances so, when, yeah. when I had a record deal. Right. right? Exactly. Like when they would front you some money and you could live on that yeah. for a little bit, but eventually that would have to get recouped. And so if you didn't sell enough, it was like, oh man. Yeah. All of that. Unless you leave. Yes. Or they let you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I left, and a and and me were all that was left of our band. <laughs> and <laughs> and we were like, do we wait? Because they're going to give us some money if they, they let us go. But Let's how long do the, we, we have to wait? We like we, up, we yeah. just took the, yeah. we took, the, took the high road, or what we thought was the high road. Yeah, to just leave. The I poor understand. guy road. <laughs> I understand it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you kept no. your integrity. Yeah. We thought we did, yeah. Yeah, it's funny how all that stuff has changed too. Because like when we were coming up in the '90s, like if you had a song in a commercial, you were hated. You were right. like a loser and a jerk. Oh, and right. now that's the best thing that can happen to anyone. <laughs> yeah, the very best thing that can happen oh, yeah. to anyone. It's so weird. Yeah. It is weird, isn't it? And it's okay. Like it's it's not. No one. I love I love that on social media now you can actually be following the artist and they can mention that. Like Reckless Eric had a you know the the chorus of his song. I go the whole wide world just to find you, but Expedia used it, right? It's like a 10 second little, you know, chunk of the song, but that obviously like helped him out in some way. He's like, you know, (laughs) there I am again for 10 seconds. Yeah, I hope assuage his rotten soul. (laughs) (laughs) What do you got? I mean, do you you find it sad that that's what's happened to art or is that just like... I think it's just that another, Warhol told us this was going to happen someday. I think that's just another someday. way it gets commercialized, right? Like it's always been yeah. kind of you know the handmaiden of of uh, you know movies, television shows, commercials, you know things yeah. like that. But the art part never goes away. Um, when you go back and listen to classic records, I don't get any of those feelings. I don't remember the commercial. I don't remember the movie it's from. I just listen to the song and go ah. That was brilliant. That's How did right. They get that. How did the carpenters get that? Or whatever it was. Like it's, <laughs> for me, it's always that. And so it'll just come back to music and art again. Need, the commerce of it comes and goes, I guess. Yes. All of us are lifers. We're all sitting around a table talking about it. So, yeah. so there must be something that, that keeps us coming back. It feeds us in some way. It, it informs us in some way that's good. Yeah. It reminds us like everything is one. Uh, everything is now. And those are the most important things to remember. Yeah. 
That's a great Amen. place to end, but we still have more time. So uh, <laughs> we'll edit that in. You guys just went on Cut tour. Paste. You went out yeah. on the road to the west. Mini tour. Who are you saying you went with Walter? With Walter Salas Humara from the Silos and had a wonderful time. He kissed me on the lips and then I got COVID. Wow, really? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, on the last show, I got COVID. I came home with that. That's not um, why or how you got it. I doubt that's how I got it. I think I got it. I, I know the moment from from that other guy who, was who bought our, in your our face. last vinyl record. We had like we sold all our merch, which was great. Yeah, but. Um, he bought that, and he was. I, I think I remember saying, "I really like you, man, but you're standing in my mouth right now. Can you please <laughs> a little bit away?" And he was telling me about his divorce and all these things, and he was very um, moved. I think, but uh, yeah, I got COVID. I think he gave. Yeah, he to kissed me. you on the mouth, and that's how you got it. Mm. <clears throat> so wait, you got COVID, and then had to ride in the van all the way back to Texas. No, we we flew oh. back. Okay, and so um, I I got it really tested. I think it was the day after or two two days yeah. after I came back and. Lovely Debbie who lives with me. She did not get it somehow. She's a superhuman. That's what she I've heard. That's the word out in the parking lot of the she's Beagle Boys. exuding health. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. The dress, Blooming the shoes. good health. Yeah. 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 Um, so how was it? What was it? Uh, was that the, f- how many tours have you guys done? I mean, we've done lots of little ones. Mostly we're a Texas band. And yeah. We've gotten older. We, we, we blossom out less, but, um, you know, Joe and Odie have been touring a lot with their other bands um, lately. Buttercup needs to get our act together and get out there more. <laughs> what other bands are you guys touring with? Um, I just, I, I go out on the road a lot with uh, Garrett T. Caps and NASA Country. Okay. We're going to know. Chicago in, in, on Wednesday. Nice. But we've been to, we went to Europe earlier this year, May and June. It's like three and a half weeks. Nice. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I just to go get her. And Joe actually just got back from Europe. Yeah, and I was playing with Walter again with his oh, old nice. band, The Silos. The Silos were a so band. So you playing with The Silos? Yeah, that's really yeah, it awesome. Became a Silo. It was yeah. weird. It was it was odd to think that you know Mitch Webb and I, when we were neighbors in the '90s, used to listen to those records all the time in yeah. the backyard. And I was like, man, this guy's great. He's a good writer. Yeah, these records kind of have this cool feel to them. And you know, I would go see them. They had that trio kind of playing in the '90s, and I would go see them at South by, or they'd come down and play Casbears in San Antonio. And one day I was just buying a T-shirt, and he was like, you live down here, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you play in bands, right? I'm like, uh-huh. He's like, you want to play in my band? I'm like, what? <laughs> and that wow. was literally it. I was like, oh, okay. And that kind of you know, started, we were kind of working on his solo records at that time, but this is the 35th anniversary of Cuba, which was a fairly big record for those guys. It was right. kind of like a Wilco-esque country rock thing when that thing really wasn't a thing yet. So When to his new sincerity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the yeah. time of Same. like the true believers Absolutely. and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, that yeah. stuff was hitting, and so were the silos. And so we just got back from two weeks in Spain playing that record pretty much in its entirety. And man, all these fans came out of the woodwork. It was great turnout. Yeah. Everybody was just sort of psyched to hear those songs again. Uh, and yeah, the original drummer, like you know, from the '90s, was on that tour. Conrad Meisner, who's uh, yeah, who's yeah, 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 who's great. He grew up. We in played Austin together. Too. That's yeah, right. We yeah, played together. Conrad's a really sweet, genteel dude, and so it was really nice to reconnect with him. But yeah, so so Odie and I do a bit of that work, and then yeah, Buttercup. Like I guess there might have been a point in the mid 2000s where we would have shifted into like a touring band, you know, gotten an agent and just kept on the road a lot more. But I think it would have come at the price of us making as many recordings as we have. Like, we have a consistent discography of, like, making a record at least every year or two. And that year, when I guess the, you know, we were getting the most lauded in the mid-2000s, we made three EPs in one year. Right. Right? Instead of being on the road. It yeah. was like we made a conscious decision right then and there to not, well, not be a steely Danish band, but that kind of band, right? The band right. that, like, wants to, like, kind of produce, like, songs. And, well, I was also... Heaven. an under the impression then and tell me if I'm wrong like I remember when that <clears throat> it was around the time when I got divorced and like MySpace <laughs> starting oh, yeah. and so you could kind of keep up with people even though you didn't see them all the time sure like on your own yep and I remember at that time like it was when Billy Harvey oh yeah put out a record and I remember you guys were doing some shows together yep. yeah is yeah, that right but back. you guys you guys yeah, when he did Pie Pie, that's that, right. That was when like, he did Pie, he was, yeah. that was a good record. Too. Uh, great yeah, record, man. Great record, yeah. Great record. He's excellent. He's he's one of my favorite uh, artists. Like, yeah, and uh, even of just people that I know, just of, of as an artist. But 
he really like all the records got so sad after that that like that's pie right. was like the last like yeah <laughs> fun true. record of his to listen to for a while yep, for a good few got years real introspective after that yeah true. but what i remember about you guys was that there was like a oh they like i can't remember if he told me this or somebody in a conversation told me this, but i was under the impression that you guys weren't playing like bars you were doing like yes. art galleries and like different kind of shows than right. so, going and playing at the white rabbit or whatever nothing against that place no yeah that, and this fits this this place fits into that sort absolutely, of absolutely yeah totally yeah thanks richard for bringing yeah us in. yeah we definitely went that direction and, and to to me that art needs the proper frame and that if you don't if you if you put it in the wrong spot sure. and then people will just ignore it yeah um, and that has been the case yeah it's so scientifically true. proven when you guys got together that was that was like something you part yeah. of what you were going to do that was good. part of the ethos is like hey we're not going to be like some band selling Miller Lite or whatever yeah I mean to quote Odie he was like I am tired of yanking my soul out of my body every Monday night at the <laughs> Tequila Mockingbird can we please you know get off the river in San Antonio in the tourist center and let's go somewhere and do this on our own terms and it got better once we did that yeah and those were the For beginning sure. of those Grackle Monday shows where we play every Monday you know at a friend's art space Okay. And, and they were like each show was radically different. We were trying to put something special yeah. together. We had a wheel that we used to spin to to choose your cover charge. Right, you could get in for free or maybe pay. I, it wasn't very much. I think four dollars was the, the highest, highest one. Yeah. yeah. It was somewhere between Little Rascals and something <laughs> highly psychedelic, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. But, but we became friends with almost everyone in the art community immediately because, you know, we were using their art spaces and their warehouses. And so there was still our And you were bringing people into them oh, yeah. that yeah. normally yeah, wouldn't thing, probably be going there. A thing yeah. started happening, yeah, the synergy between all of us, really, as artists. And we knew. We were like, ah, this is, this is the way. This is how it should yeah. go. Yeah, like, I mean, people would show up at the regular gig and then there would be a trailer out front and we'd get everyone in it and drive around the neighborhood and <laughs> oh, singing trailer, like flatbed yeah. trailer and, you know, like with people with weird hats and stuff. I mean, it's super fun. Yeah. You know, they just didn't know what was going to happen. Did it get to a point there where like you, you had to like really like you couldn't just play a show like you had to come up with this whole did that was that daunting after a while? Daunting was that difficult? because, you know, you know, and at a point the it was so was fun. High. The bar <laughs> was high. And then we were trying to learn new songs and record right. things at the same time. But it was like really our energies had to be devoted to this live performance thing to make it to be able to pull right. it off. We weren't even recording yet. No. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we were writing, and it we was were just writing. writing. And people were starting to donate money. I remember Wilton just threw a hundred dollars, like in change, on the stage one night, and said, "These guys need to make a record here. Help me!" <laughs> and he just threw all this money yeah. at us. He had Coins. gone. He, he had gone to, to the mall, like <laughs> to he, where there's, there's a, a fountain. There used to be a fountain at, at uh, Central Park <laughs> Mall, right. or you know, you make a wish and you throw coins in. He went there and took all the coins out. That's and right. They were all like, you know, green, green and yeah. moldy, and he just dumped it on the stage, and that was the seed money for our first record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think normally stealing the money out of those wish things would karmically be not good, but I right. think in this case it probably was good. Oh, oh no. it was brilliant! Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it really moved me because yeah. then it, yeah. it and it instantly shifted for me. I felt a sudden overwhelming. Uh, support and just recentering of oh we have to now record yeah like they just boom and we made our first record right yeah. for four hundred dollars yeah it was really inexpensive yeah. but Mark Rubenstein produced those records so Mark was in the rejects he was in a bunch of seminal punk rock bands in San Antonio and then he and I uh, ended up playing in this like little jazz trio together he on accordion me on guitar and Greg Norris on bass what's the relationship to jazz and uh, and and punk rock because there seems to be a bit, a bit I understand you know, the one I, between folk and punk rock. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. The lounge lizard sort of lounge. There, there is that. Lie that, there, right? Yeah. And that whole New York scene it was kind of a bit like that yeah. John Zorn. But I don't know. I don't know. But it, but it I was. I think it's the attitude. Maybe it is. This yeah, freedom. Yeah, the, the attitude of cool. The yeah. freedom. Yeah. Jazz. Well, like, and the freedom nobody's to freedom. do this or we can do this. Somebody said you can't do that. Well, watch this. Then we're this. gonna do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, there's, that's there's definitely there's contrarianism. No, I'll show you too loud. Yeah. You're not playing enough notes. I'll show you not playing enough. Extremes, yeah. yeah. And so perhaps that's a bit mm -hmm. it. But, but Mark was a consummate musician and a great producer for those first couple of records. It was great. I basically buy the Pro Tool system from him when he moves away, and we continue making records on that. 
little tiny rig for another five years, I guess, or maybe longer. Oh, it was longer. Than yeah. yeah. What about this new record? Did you guys record it yourselves? We did mm-hmm. it ourselves. We pretty much self. We had one other producer, Salim Narala from Dallas. Right? Yeah. So we've I done shows with Salim. And, yeah. And he worked great. And uh, yeah, and I ended up playing on a bunch of records with him, touring yeah. with him. And we're still great friends. And he's an, a great ally for us in Dallas. So if anything, we kind of ended up growing, you know, friends in different places where you can go and perform. But yeah, that took the place of touring. Like, it really did. And, and I really am glad, in hindsight, that we have this entire backlog of music to, to share with people. It also, I mean, it seems like, like when you were touring, you were opening for Walter, right? Yeah. Or Ian. Oh, totally. Ian yeah, we, Ian, we played with Or Ian, Ian Moore. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah, guys yeah. Played with, you played with But it's great too. because we opened... As Buttercup, and then we're Ian Moore's band. Right. Oh, really? We open as we played as the Silos, opening Buttercup, but Buttercup opened for the Silos, and, and we are we also the Silos. silos. We had to right. ch- bring two pairs of clothes to <laughs> yeah. change. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but uh, but anyways, yeah. So so those things kind of happened, and it's great that they can do it. Like they can afford to bring us out. We can play our little set, and then we can, you know, like... Wait, when was the Ian stuff on this last tour? No, that was no, about no. a decade ago. That was ago. 2012, I yeah. think. Jason oh, Garner that's even after I toured with him, Yeah, playing with him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he had just done that record with Matt Harris, the El Sonido Nuevo. Yeah. So yeah. that's that record, which is a really psychedelic record for Ian. Yeah. And I think he heard us and thought, oh, these guys could match that psychedelic sound, and we did. Yeah. It was really fun. It was really nice to get to know Ian, too. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Absolutely. That was one of my, that's my favorite tour I've ever been on. I never had more fun and just more. Yeah, was Cullen on that one, too? It was kind of, yeah. Oh, my God. It was I me, Cullen. Oh, did you? I love you, Cullen. Yeah. Me, Cullen, uh, Matt. It was George Reef for a little while, which was really awesome, uh, so too. Good. But that's where I met Matt, and then Matt and I ended up being roommates and then becoming great friends oh, through wow. that tour. Oh, Matt. Like r- roommates on tour. Matt was awesome. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's and awesome. Kyle Schneider, who played with me and Anar back in the day, oh, was yeah. the drummer. Kyle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Kyle. Kyle. Right. Yeah, so it was, it was a nice... Well, it was Kyle who said, we played at the White Rabbit in San Antonio, and we opened for Ian, and then he gave us like a CD burn of that new CD. Yeah. And Kyle went, hey, man, did he give you that... He's, we're like, yeah. He's like, he didn't give him one. He never does that. He didn't oh. give me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he didn't give me one. I'm like, oh, really? And then we yeah. knew it's like, oh, there must be something about that. But he's turned out to be a great friend. Oh man, he's awesome. That's I'm funny because awesome. that record with like, uh, that took it over to the east side, yeah. like that, that stuff. Like that to me was like that's like the ultimate. Yeah, Ian Moore record, like my favorite yeah. record. Definitely, oh, he loved. It's, it's, a, it's great a great record. record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a Never cool really. record, and we were we're we're a good backing band. Yeah, yeah. we had know? a lot of yeah. fun on those days. Like, I don't know who we should be advertising this to, but <laughs> Nico, who Case. needs us? Nico, Do yeah, you, she you, should definitely. You need a good sloppy band. Yeah, I we're, like a sloppy we're cheap. band. We yeah. sleep in one bunk. Yeah, we're, we're cheap. We're, we Wait, so who's yeah. who's playing drums today? One of us. We all are. We all are. All of us are gonna. Yeah. Joe's the one who can really play it, but Odie yeah. looks coolest. Uh, True. And then Eric tries hardest. Jamie, <laughs> Jamie doesn't play with you guys no. anymore. He he has left the band. Okay, and he left in 2010. Okay, and since then, really? we we have not had a permanent drummer until uh, Claire officially yeah. joined during the pandemic. But I think at this point we're we're kind of back to like. And know. then she played drums on this record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she played oh. drums on the record. Yeah, she. Wow. Yeah, we're about to put out a, a new record that um, is is has no drums. It's actually just a minimalistic. We're gonna play a few songs off it tonight, um, which is just uh, single acoustic guitar, electric bass, and voice. Yeah, and it's um, like an arena rock record. And it's so kind of like um, we <laughs> went to uh, Danny. Yeah, we went punk to punk Danny Reich, who still had okay. that studio on yeah, Third yeah, Street yeah, right? yeah, when yeah. when the East Side of Austin hadn't blown up and gotten overly expensive. And so we made that record there in what four days? Yeah, something like that. Like nothing, but it was really interesting to have that aesthetic of like, okay, we really only have the one guitar. We really only have the bass. Like, what can they do? And then we started minimizing those parts where I would just play one string and he would play one string. I'm like, yeah, we it, have five other strings. I'm like, eh, just this. It's, it's, uh, you get obsessed with minimalism, and at a certain point, it's like, that kind of sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it's right. a two yeah. string, yeah. right? It's, it's, like a, yeah. it's like a bar chord or something. I'm like, no, that's too much. Yeah. yeah. And it was fun. Danny did a great job of capturing it, and he was a lot of fun to work with. And but we, we sat on this record for a while yeah. because uh, at the time, we deemed it kind of, it's kind of harsh 
uh, and maybe flat out depressing. And so, <laughs> but now listening to it, it's aged really well. And we were doing these pieces when we just toured with with Walter, and people were blown away. They really love this performance piece that we do. Um, we we're normally a very talkative band, and we talk between songs. And there's a lot of storytelling and stuff. Yeah. With this piece, we we say nothing. There's just silence. The only thing we speak is with the songs, and then we also have an easel where we write messages. Um, and it's kind of interesting. And and they give... reflect pieces of the song. They, and they're, they're funny, so they, they kind of lighten yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. depressing content coming out yeah. of the songs. Um, but, but the songs are funny, too. Yeah. My favorite part now is that we give out evaluation sheets after the show <laughs> with pens and pencils, and we have people fill those out. And it's the best feedback we've ever received. It's yeah. the most honest... Yeah. You know, a lot of times people don't like it's fine, whatever. But but their comments are so prescient. I think it was a brilliant idea on Eric's part to go. We're going to pass these out. I'm like, this well, is great. I mean, you, you, the college classes I've taught. You know, like we put these course evals at the end, and I was like, why don't we do that? Yes. Set, e- set eval, <laughs> and it's and, and there's funny stuff like you know, do you like too much hair, just right hair, less yeah, yeah, hair, yeah. and you know, <laughs> what do you think about our fashion choices and stuff like that? You know, silly stuff. But then there's like some serious questions. Yeah, you know, they sneak about in. The, 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 but the know. responses are so heartfelt and honest. I just can't believe it. Some of them are really honest and heartfelt and make me sort of cry when I think about them because yeah. they're so beautiful. I'm like, oh, yeah, we really touched somebody. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, and there's proof. Yeah. Like a lot of times, you just pack up and leave, and you, you're not sure. You hey, know? you guys were pretty that good. Felt, that felt good. Thank you. You know, right. but there's but there's really no proof, <laughs> not even in photos. But there they are, those evaluations, and right. we can go through them on the plane and be just like, "Oh my God, look at this! This is great!" Yeah, yeah. it was a really great idea. So that's my favorite part of the show right now is getting those back and <laughs> sitting in the van and going, "Oh." Well, the day before we left, two couple days before the, the the we left on tour, there's a band called Night Palace that was coming through town. Uh, it's a uh, She's uh, from Mrs. Palace, Georgia, <laughs> and uh, she's super talented. It's kind of like a soccer mommy type pop singer. Mm. Um, better, yeah. it's really really great. Night Palace, and we um, we did a opening set for her to to run the set, and it was like on a Monday night, and so we were kind of helping her by like we dragged our closest friends, and we did the set evals before and we got some really good feedback before we went on the tour and we made changes in the, the oh, songs great. based on yeah. like you know what you know like that's true like a couple people were like you, you, you need to get those two songs get, don't go together right get to the to the really hit song faster and then we did that and it yeah. was better it was a lot better cut some things the cool. hit song there's so many yeah i know <laughs> it's, it's really Be like specific. you couldn't have you couldn't have done that when you were young no no Get honest feedback from people. Would you know what I mean? Yeah, no. probably. It not. Hey, wait, been... who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> that fucking guy in the yellow shirt. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or it would have just been small, blow me like in yeah. giant letters yeah, across yeah. the whole thing, but and like, then just made into a paper airplane uh, and thrown at us. Right? But I mean, yeah. in us and our youth, like I would, I, I appreciate and welcome criticism now. But when if Rod- Robbie Krieger had come up mm-hmm. after the show and been like, you know, hey, you know, you guys might want to try this in your set, I'd be like, well, you're wearing stupid pants and a fanny pack. <laughs> So you have no, you know, you know, I'd always, I wouldn't be able to accept that or I didn't want it because I thought I was awesome. Right, right, right. 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 And then probably secretly we're afraid that you weren't awesome, but you were awesome. Right, right. Now you know you're awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Enough. I mean, that's at least how I feel. You were saying that thing about your relationship changing to performing. I mean, it reminds me of what I'm trying to get at in the song about my voice, which is getting to this place where comfortable with and not chewing your arm off after a show because you were flat yeah or feeble i mean i can't have john lennon's voice no matter what i want you know there's None no of us can. there's no, no but even at the top of that song when you're screaming the urgency yeah. and rawness that john lennon conveyed oh, in true. his singing especially yeah. like in the early Good records points. and then once he went through the weird screaming thing yeah. uh i like that yeah. yeah everybody loves the weird screaming thing He's a good screamer. He's a great screamer. Yeah. Yeah. Great whistler. Yeah. A great whistler. Oh, yeah. So excellent. <laughs> See, right? This yep. is true. I knew you could do it. <laughs> yeah. None of us can whistle. No, We're all I'm terrible. thinking about Andrew Bird right now. Oh, yeah. That guy whistles like a bird. He does. Yeah, well, apt name. That oh, guy yeah. whistles Debbie like a bird. Debbie and I... All, we met him a few weeks ago. Him and uh, oh, Sam Bream uh, from... Out in Marfa. 
Uh, no, Alpine, no, at the Tobin Center. Oh, we, oh, we, he came through. That's right. Yeah, they, they, it was a weird thing. We went and saw Iron Wine. He, he is so good, Sam Bream. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good. And Andrew Bird is like a freak. Yeah. Of, of talent yeah. and they played together and it was really interesting kind of shambly show that they put together where they were collaborating and, awesome um, and uh, someone had paid a lot of money to have these backstage passes and they got scared or something and they just gave them to us no way and so they were these oh, fun. these these special things and, and then Debbie was and Debbie's shy and she's like well should we go back there I'm like, we're going back yeah. No, and yeah. so like Sam, Sam Bream was back there. And, I mean, there's no one else there. We're just backstage milling about. Wow. I have the the Andrew um, Bird record that I just bought, and um, but but Sam was super nice. He was just like, hey, you want one of these, these tacos? I mean, he was just super great. She said, Had a great conversation said, with him. These nice passes come nice. with a free glass of Looks wine. Looks much younger backstage than on stage. Yeah, on, on stage huh. because his hair is 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 so receding. Yeah, and and long, and and then the beard is so big, he kind of looks like Father Time. Yeah, but he's he's very spry. I had an interesting experience. Me and Billy Harvey had an interesting experience with Bono in that way. We Whoa. were both backstage at U two, and we were like, we're odious to Bono, but there was a guy that m- monopolized the whole backstage. <laughs> oh hang man, time. one guy, horrible guy. But it was great to watch Bono deal with a guy that was inviting him over to his house. It was really actually oh, awesome right. to watch oh, a superstar cool. be like, you know, I, I don't think you want us at your house. We're, we're going to tear shit up, you know, like, just kind of being funny. <laughs> but um, anyway, we, we, were, we were standing that far from Bono, and he was a little squatty guy. Like, we were both just, like, looking at him. And, like, Billy and I were like, this is so weird. Like, he doesn't look like Bono at all. Like, he has Bono's face, but, like, Bono has fat little fingers, and, like, he's a <laughs> real short guy that, like, looks is kind of square-bodied. Yeah. And then 15 minutes later, he came out on stage, and it was like, oh, that Bono. Like, it was like two completely different guys. That's, That's amazing. Like, you were saying that guy looks younger backstage? Yeah, he does. Yeah. yeah. Bono yeah. looks yeah. far less Bono in real life than he does on stage. That makes sense. There's some kind of transformation that the stage does. I mean, yeah. they, they say psychologically, like, if, if, you're, if you're in front of a, a very beautiful person, a beautiful woman or something, that they, they can actually psychologists can measure your your face tightens a little and, and the wrinkles reduce and really? things happen and then you kind of get better posture and all uh, these things happen is that why i'm slouching yeah look we're yeah, all slouching I'm so good looking yeah <laughs> but so but so that that really <laughs> that really speaks to um inner beauty right is true beauties is within yeah like yeah. when you go out on stage like or, I mean, when you meet them in person, there's yeah. this, like, beauty that comes out. That's the real person. Oh, and yeah. And you can That's be maybe u- not but on ugly stage. on the outside, but if you're beautiful on the inside, you Truly. I mean, yeah, absolutely. you're beautiful on the outside. That's I mean, just how it goes. Prince seems like somebody who's, like, a god of that. Um, yeah. You know, otherworldly, one of those true artists that, that is also a freaky um, genius type, yeah. type person and also just incredibly beautiful and sexual and all this stuff. And then I've seen interviews where he's struggling with the same stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that, that he's, he was human. Yeah. Um, and, and, and self-deprecating and all this stuff. And, and really probably trying to get to that honest place where he could believe in himself and love himself. Yeah. It's cool. That's the weird thing about the arts is that, you know, being a creative person, like there is just that, when you make something and no one's seen it yet, there is like literally like, this could be it. This could be the thing that I put out and everyone's like, okay, you're done. This is the last <laughs> we've been putting up for you. That's how I feel like every time I put stuff out and even like the older I get, I'm like, oh, this is it. They're yeah, gonna be like, right. all right, dude, we've yeah. had enough of these songs. <laughs> Heard your voice enough. Let's move on to a new guy. I wanna say, it, it seems like it would be like that, but almost to the person, like to the people that we know, as we all get older, they get better. Charlie Rodman, who was in Evergreen, yep. has become an excellent singer-songwriter. His actual show... Where that Peloponnesian just, Wars album was insane. Oh, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. It's gotten better. I still better. listen to it. Now he's, now he's just writing songs. <laughs> I just songs. listened to it two weeks ago. Going, <laughs> oh, I drove to Corpus Christi to go fishing. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. It, oh, my God. Yeah. But, but he recently wrote a song about his daughter learning how to drive. It's incredible. He, wrote, he had Robert Harrison produce it, right? He's oh, a great yeah. producer. Great producer. So, so all of us are still striving and still, I think, getting better, improving, like getting closer to whom we are as human beings, and maybe that's what's making the art better. Right. I like older. what you're saying, Johnny, about like you, that you're going to put something out. At least for me, I think Stephen King says that if, if you feel repulsed by what you're writing, yeah. it's 
probably good. Yeah, um, good. you know, or it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, yeah. and, and so, like, if you if you're worried that like, everyone's going to be like, shame on you, Johnny Gowdy. Yeah, that's yeah, degenerate. Yeah. You're yeah. you're canceled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then maybe you're doing something good. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. could yeah. be. Could be. I don't know. Who knows? Well, the important thing is is to just like keep pushing the boundaries and keep trying keep collaborating like even jamie rodman is like the consummate uh just luthier now just like oh yeah. he's world oh, really? such world oh my yeah. god if you need any any guitar work jamie rodman i mean he'll make his own tools fucking, oh, like, wow. for, man. for antique yeah guitars he's and in fretboard journal now like he's, I mean, he's he, done really well yeah. metal lathing all kinds of crazy stuff that he's he a do. true artist yeah. wow yeah oh my god yeah. yeah well you guys are true artists Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm glad that, that we got to do this. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We do it again. To drive, again. It's really good to see you I want to do a show with you guys. Do you guys still back up people? Would you back up me? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, like, but only if I dress like Robbie Krieger. You can keep yeah. <laughs> you got to dress like Robbie Krieger and then it's a go for sure. I mean, if we could all dress like Robbie Krieger. Mm. Mm. No, we could just be the Robbie Kriegers. <laughs> You know who me and Anar met and had a photo with, and I don't know what happened to it at that thing in Dallas that time? Ivanka Trump. No, no Ivana way. Trump. The mom. The, the mom, one that died. Ivanka. The one, I don't know. The one I still have the picture of, of me and Eric. I mean, Kevin and Eric with uh, Space Ghost. Space Ghost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we had a picture of Space Ghost. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I still have that Polaroid. Sounds oh. weird. We were playing a cable convention, so every oh channel from your television had a booth that you could walk into. <laughs> This is the first time I heard of much music. I didn't know about much music. None of us That's did. Yeah, Canadian. Yeah, because right? yeah, it was Canadian. Canadian. Yeah, because yeah. so, they didn't have MTV. Yeah, they had they much music. Right. Yeah. Well, they were playing Canadian. Mike Morales' video. That was because he didn't get by, picked up by MTV on the first one. Uh, so we ended up, you know, playing a bunch of shows in Canada. Do you guys? Uh, when is your next album coming out? Soon. Soon. Um, yeah, it's, it's soon. <laughs> mark your calendar. We mark your calendar. <laughs> future. Um, <laughs> I, you know, we're 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 negotiating like um, what would be the the worst time of year to release it and we're gonna probably hit that either december or january i think yeah, yeah. something like that yeah, yeah that's usually the time yeah. but the best time in, in, in for austin people is like oh yeah no i'm releasing it the week of south by southwest so right. that oh everyone God. will get to hear it oh, like, oh okay that's gonna work you. <sighs> dropping the bucket yeah. there yeah. uh the yeah. so you're gonna be in the town during south by? all right so people can find you guys at wearebuttercup.com are there any uh, other shows coming up uh we don't really have anything right now okay sorry no, that's okay. No, no I like it when people don't have to, to promote uh, a thing. Out what what the next step is? We do have some some. We are in negotiations with with a potentially grandiose show that will happen. Okay, that, that's probably going to be twenty four hours straight of music. Of us oh, playing. that that involves and, the and city probably of San you San will need to help us. Oh, geez, uh, yeah, I I would be there for that. Okay, to celebrate twenty four hour constant music. Yeah, and having people come in and out, other musicians play, but uh, yeah. And, and having a, a flow of I would love to do music. that. It could be the debut of the Robbie Kriegers. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's the band. The yeah, that's our band. The name. RKs. Yeah. He's so talented, by the, the way. Robbie, oh, I yeah, no, like no, to no. Say. He can play. I want to thank play. Richard for inviting me down, everyone here Thanks, at, the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, at the Bugle Boy. It's in LaGrange, of all places. What a great, what a great, great room this is. Yeah. You think everybody has played that riff to that song in this room, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. No. Or is it like taboo? No, I know a lot of guests that have been on the show. I feel like this whole wall, with the exception of Woody Russell, has been on my show. That's Everyone great. has. Yeah, wow. I'm pretty sure. That's amazing. Excellent. Yeah, Kevin. Good Carolyn, work, buddy. Gaucher, the whole good gang. Work. All right, well, thanks so much for having us. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having us, man. That's good to see you, man. Yes, Eric Sandin, Joe Reyes, and Odie, Buttercup. Get out there and find them at wearebuttercup.com. What a great conversation, man. What a great conversation. I love those dudes. I love them. I hope that we stay in touch now. I'm going to tell them whenever I'm coming to San Antonio, they're going to let me know what's going on. I want to thank my friend Richard Scants for setting that whole thing up. I want to thank Heather and everybody at The Bugle Boy. I urge all of you to get out there. Check out The Bugle Boy in LaGrange, thebugleboy.org. Okay, check out Buttercup. We are buttercup.com. Find them. That's where you do your business with Buttercup. Great, great time. I want to thank everyone. What a great, great, great conversation. Share this with all your friends. You can follow us and see the pictures and uh, a couple of short videos from this at uh, How Did I Get Here, our Facebook page. Follow us there. Check it out. Like it. Leave a comment. Share it. You can find this podcast wherever it is you stream podcasts, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Overcast, Stitcher. New podcast every Tuesday and every Friday. And now we've been dropping from the vaults late Saturday nights. 
All right. So get through, you scroll through our stuff. If you're new to the show, check it out. If you're a fan of the show, share this. If you're a fan of Buttercup, share this. Great, great, great talking to those guys. Check out the Bugle Boy and uh, have a great week, whatever it is you're doing. Let's get down. Why do I know this song? It's the voice of reflection of the soul. And if so, does my feeble throat mean my soul? us unique, my voice, my little voice. I always loved John Lennon's voice the best, once I could finally hear the difference from Paul or George. Later on, other voices came to me. I give my right leg to sing like that On stage I joked about getting a voice transplant Ho 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 Very funny So here we are now Faced with the choice Love yourself or don't But to love yourself, you gotta love your voice And make it sing I love my voice, 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 I love my voice Love.